You know, recently we had a chance to drive the brand new Honda Accord, a car the company is hoping will do well. However, Honda did tell us that the midsize segment is shrinking and shrinking quickly thanks to the ever-growing popularity of SUVs and CUVs. So maybe it makes sense that Hyundai is calling the launch of their third-generation Santa Fe the most important launch since the Elantra. You know, they say when you're hot, you're hot. Well, that best describes Hyundai. In fact, over the past several years, they have made few mistakes in launching new product. Can they keep that streak alive with the new Santa Fe? We're about to find out. The first generation was one of the first car-based uh, CUVs or, or crossover vehicles on the marketplace. And for a lot of consumers, that really hit the mark. It's what they were looking for. This new vehicle continues down the same path, but uh, much, much more refined than an SUV. Our research tells us that uh, 20, over 20% 20 of uh, all Canadians that are in, in purchase mode for a vehicle are considering uh, an SUV, compact or intermediate SUV. So it's a huge market. Our new 2.4 liter uh, four-cylinder engine is uh, the most powerful uh, four-cylinder base model in its competitive set has a full 190 horsepower, 181 foot-pounds of torque, but uh, has the best fuel efficiency of any of our competitors. Uh, people are looking for the power uh, of a V6, and our new twin-scroll turbocharged uh, four-cylinder engine provides actually more uh, torque than most V6s, but with substantially better fuel economy. Now, North America's got to, got to start to learn what the Europeans have known for years. Four cylinders work. My choice would be the turbo. Uh, it's got a bit of get up and go, this thing zings. You know, it's a good looking vehicle. Um, the exterior is nice, the interior is very nice. Um, drives well, um, it's going to be a winner for me. Like most Hyundais, this Santa Fe comes loaded with active and passive safety features, but they drop the ball when they come up with a red indicator instead of an amber indicator light. Also, they have dropped the 3.5 V6 in favor of a four-cylinder, two-liter turbo, and they have lightened this vehicle by 120 kilograms. How much is that? Well, Hyundai says it's the equivalent of either nine golf bags or better yet, 57 six-packs of beer. For our next little wow. exercise here, yeah. what we're trying to showcase is we had this idea, we've seen these vehicles before where they cram a whole bunch of one item in and we said, well, that's no fun, you know, a bunch of soccer balls, what does that mean? We have a, an equivalent load of camping equipment that a family would need to go out for the weekend. And so we said, there's so much cargo space in this vehicle, if you utilize all of the space in the trunk, it can get in there. And the idea is, if we have a group of, let's say, 10, 15 journalists, can you get it all into the vehicle? And in fact, they were so successful, they managed to get it all in there, and they said, oh, there's more space, there's plenty more space. So we threw on some additional bags, and we even threw in a journalist slash racing driver named Russ Bond. Is there an escape handle? All right, let's go, let's go for a drive. You know, I like the interior on the Santa Fe. What I don't like, and maybe it's just me, I got kind of a wonky back, I find the seats a little hard. One feature I do like, which you're beginning to see on a lot of Kias and Hyundais, and that's a selective steering mode. Instead of spending a lot of money on tuning the suspension, you can actually tune the feel of the steering wheel. We have normal, we have comfort, and we have sport. It's just another way that Hyundai and Kia can add a lot of content into their cars at an affordable price. They've sort of overcome the, the, the stigma that was attached to them, and now they've got a great looking product, which also really helps because it's just as easy to build an ugly car as it is to build a good one, and this one's one of the best looking ones yet. After the launch of the Santa Fe, the story broke about the incorrect fuel economy numbers being posted by both Hyundai and Kia. But you know, even before that, Hyundai was quite aware that despite the fact that their product continues to improve, the elephant known as trust remains in the room. Our job is to build up that opinion 
uh, with, with the Canadian public. There's still a ways to go. Our, our research shows, shows that we're getting there. We've turned the corner, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a long road. It's very easy to lose a reputation, very hard to gain one back to the bulletproof kind of level like, like you have a Toyota or Honda right now. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Sit up straight, children. It's time for your English literature lesson. That's later on Kenzie's Corner. For the better part of a dozen years, it soldiered on unchanged. In the automotive world, it was a dinosaur. On this edition of Test Drive, the long, long overdue replacement. This is the all-new Ford Escape. The changes to the third generation Escape, which is now based on the Focus platform, transform it so much that the only thing the new model has in common with the old is its name. Everything from the powertrain and advanced all-wheel drive system to the manner in which the cabin cosets its occupants is now radically different. The interior of this Escape has been very well done indeed. Great materials and if you go with the titanium, well, and you add a few more options, you can get everything except the kitchen sink. Now on this thing, leather seats, panoramic moonroof, the tech package which gives you among other things blind spot monitoring, and a navigation system. That puts about $4,700 worth of options in here. The knee to the nether region, $30 for an environmental fee. While the base escape arrives with a so-so two and a half liter four cylinder engine, the up-level models earn a choice of two EcoBoost engines, Ford's delightful turbocharged units. The 1.6 liter EcoBoost and its 178 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque is fine, the 2.0-litre EcoBoost motor, however, is the motivator of choice. It not only bumps the power to a much more sporty 240, it brings a stout 270 pound-feet of torque. This puts some serious fire under the hood. Part of the reason is the peak torque and the fact it shows up early. The other side boils down to the relative lack of turbo lag. Yes, there is a hint on initial launch, but as soon as the engine hits 1500 RPM, it begins to pull, and strongly so. Believe it or not, there are four different ways of getting into the cargo area. There's a button on the dash, one on the key fob, there's a handle right here. The fourth way, you simply kick under the bumper, and it opens the tailgate. Now, when it rises up out of the way, you've got 34 cubic feet with the seats up, and 68 with them folded flat, which is a lot of space. The other thing I like, behind the passenger seat, there's an underfloor storage bin. When teamed with a six-speed manumatic, the Escape runs from rest to 100 kilometers an hour in 8.1 seconds and manages the more important 80 to 120 passing move in a solid five seconds. If there is a nit, it has to do with the manual side of the automatic transmission. The shifter must be put in the sport position and then the driver can change gears but only after fighting with a fiddly toggle switch on the side of the shifter. Given the overt sportiness of the Escape, it demands paddle shifters that work regardless of shifter position. This Escape has what Ford call an intelligent all-wheel drive system. By monitoring 25 different inputs, everything from steering, gas pedal and wheel speed, it determines the best way of splitting the power. For example, if you nail the gas pedal on a slippery road, it's already splitting the power 50-50, which minimizes the risk of wheel spin. What makes it all the more remarkable and keeps it invisible to the driver is the fact that it looks at all this data every 16 milliseconds. That is 20 times faster than I can blink. The Escape benefits greatly from its vastly superior platform for many reasons, not the least of which is the blend of ride and handling it allows. The Escape is tight and displayed very little body roll through the pylons. The steering affords great feedback and the P23545R19 tires, along with that all-wheel drive system, push understeer out to the point where it's moot. It also delivers the right highway ride, soaking up the rough stuff without the unseemly jostling so many sporty crossovers 
forced the riders to endure. You know, there is no question that this latest escape is a very good crossover. Two great EcoBoost engines and a very good all-wheel drive system. You can also have it just about any way you want it, but therein lies the rub. The escape starts at about $20,000. This puppy sitting right here is over $42,000. I'm sorry, that amount of money is not escaping from my wallet anytime soon. And no, the rain didn't make me crusty. Can-Am RV in London, Ontario, and they've partnered with us this year with the Canadian Truck King Challenge to give us some heavyweight trailers to match our one-ton dualies. HD, of course, stands for heavy duty, and these are the trucks that, that do the heavy duty work. They do the, the hauling, the towing, and they're a small segment of the market because most people don't need anything this large, but there are still are people that need them for work. These are serious work trucks. And it's very important that if someone's going to put out a truck and say this is a work truck, well, we have to find out, can it do what they say? Strictly uh, one-ton trucks this year, diesel, dualies, we've got Ford, we have the Ram, we have the Silverado. These are the heavyweights within the pickup truck world, and we've stuck the heaviest trailers on them that we can find. These are the big three. These are the only truck manufacturers that make a heavy duty. Uh, Toyota and Nissan do not. This is as close to apples and apples as you can get. And uh, with the amount of weights that we're towing, we're going to be putting uh, two tons of payload in there in the way of shingles. We want to see how each one performs back to back. And with five judges cycling through the trucks, we're going to get some really good impressions. I'm five foot four and I'm sort of looking down over this enormous hood. It, uh, it, it's a lot of truck. This is a competitive, competitive segment because the guys that buy this are not trying to show off. They're working with them. So how well they do out there, how well they tow, how well they handle payload really matters. So they will pay attention to these results. After all was said and done, fuel calculated, the five judges rotating through, after driving almost 3,000 kilometers over two days, the Chevy Silverado 3500 came out the winner. The Chevy's got a little bit of work to do on its interior. However, you could not take away the fact that its towing power, its ability to handle payload, and just its road manners in general were impeccable. Did you know? Brought to you by the Kia Optima Hybrid. Tire pressure has an enormous effect on fuel economy and safety. Most tires lose about one PSI per month naturally. A tire that's underinflated by just two PSI increases fuel consumption by 1%. If you doubt the extra workload, just try pushing a car with a flat tire. According to the American Automobile Association, this means 4.5 billion liters of wasted fuel every year in North America alone. Of more concern is the increased risk of a blowout. The National Highway Traffic Safety Association says that every year there are 660 highway fatalities and 33,000 injuries due to underinflated tires. Frightening statistics indeed. And that should underline to all drivers the importance of proper tire pressure. What's the most fun you can have with your clothes on for, say, $107? I'll show you on the Two Minute Test Drive. The motoring tip of the week is brought to you by Walmart. For everyday low prices on Pennzoil, conventional, and synthetic oils. 
Our motoring tip of the week concerns TPMS, which is an abbreviation for tire pressure monitoring systems. Now, your late model vehicle may or may not be equipped with this important safety feature. Here's what you should know. First of all, when you turn the key on in the morning, look for the TPMS icon on the dash. And these TPMS sensors are set up typically to alarm or set off that light on the dash if the tire is 25% underinflated or 50% overinflated. So we know that underinflated tires are the primary cause of, of tire failure, and this can lead to rollover crashes and injuries. So it's a very important safety feature. A couple of different styles and types of TPMS sensors. This one outwardly appear, appears like a normal valve stem, but inside the rim is our TPMS sensor. This is a universal style. This one is the, the type used by many car manufacturers as original equipment, and it's more visually identifiable, a rigid stem on the outside, different color and shape to the stem, and there's our sensor, which is the heart of the system, inside the rim where you can't see it. But you as a motorist need to know that you still need to do monthly tire pressure checks, whether your vehicle's equipped with TPMS or not. Any time you do a tire pressure check on any vehicle, you should use this little nib on the tire pressure gauge to just blip a little bit of air out to clean the tip of the valve stem. Take your reading, and when you're finished, make sure that you replace the cap. That's your motoring tip of the week. Here's a few nameplates for you. Focus, Civic, Cruise, Mazda 3, Elantra, and Corolla. Without a doubt, heavyweights in the compact segment. Well, recently we were in California in wine country to check out a vehicle that has to take this gang on. And this vehicle is celebrating 30 years in North America, and it's called the Nissan Sentra. This is our seventh generation century. We've had Sentra since the early 80s. The compact segment's largest segment in Canada and is critical to our success. Sentra was previously trying to be kind of an edgy sort of a car. They had that kind of plain R look. And the PR people didn't really come out and say it, but they kind of implied that the styling got old really quickly. When you look at the last couple of years, I mean, four major changes by our key competitors. Uh, we had to step up the game. We really had to look at the product from the ground up, redesign it from the start, and what we put together with the 2013 Sentra is a pretty compelling package. So they're hoping with this new car that it will be a, a longer-lived sort of styling. To me, it looked a little bit like the Elantra, which is not a bad thing, and it's a much nicer car inside than the previous Sentra. They've, everybody has finally figured out that you don't want your elbows resting on hard plastic. You know, they knew that 30 years ago. They're finally getting around to doing something about it. The engine is new for Sentra. It's an all-new 1.8-liter uh, four-cylinder combined with the new CVT, similar to what we launched last year in the uh, Versus sedan. The fuel economy is a great story for us. It's 5.8 liters combined with the best-in-class fuel economy. We've done that through managing mass, improving CVT, improving engine technologies. A litany, we've looked at every piece of the car, optimized it to deliver best-in-class. The consumer seems to want fuel economy numbers and then they also want remote start, so they let the car idle for 15 minutes, which means they're not that interested in fuel consumption, so I don't really know what's going on there. I don't think it's going to blow the market away, but uh, it, it'll get a better share of the market than the uh, previous Sentra got. If you're a Nissan fan, and I know people that buy nothing else, they'll be happy as a clam with that car. Closed captioning for Motoring 2013 is brought to you by Greener, Fuel Efficient, Global. This is Chevrolet Now, driving our world forward. It's called pathetic fallacy. It's a literary technique whereby the natural conditions are supposed to reflect the mood of the characters in the play or the poem or the story. Now, in this particular case, it's raining out today. Yeah, I'll need that for my glasses later, Dan. It's raining out today, and that makes me depressed. Now, normally, I'm a happy guy. I know I play a curmudgeon here on Kenzie's Corner, but I'm normally pretty cheerful. But a couple of things recently have made me really sad. First of all, BMW Canada sold more of the X6. That's the SUV with no room in it. It's ugly and goes downhill from there. You know that one? They sold more of those than in the best year ever of the 5 Series station wagon. What's wrong with those people? I don't get it. 
And secondly, I just got a survey from a leasing company in the States that listed the five favorite options of modern cars. You know what's number one on the list? Blind spot monitoring systems. As I've told you a billion times, every car has a blind spot monitoring system. It's called your side view mirrors. If they spent a tenth of the money they, they paid to try and develop these systems, and just putting an ad out saying, folks, those side view mirrors, adjust them so there are no blind spots, end of problem. People love these things. What's wrong with them? Another one on that list, voice control. You can activate your sat-nav by voice control. City, please. Montreal. Did you mean Moncton? If I meant Moncton, I would have said Moncton. These things simply don't work. What do people see in these deals? The only thing on that list that made any sense was zero gravity seats. It's interesting too, it's the only item on the list that's brand specific. Only Nissan has these seats and they're designed to be much better for your backside so that everything is perfectly smooth and natural. It's like you're floating in space. They're really good. It's a comfortable seat, very, very important. The rest of this stuff, I guess I just have to accept there's more of them than there is of us. I'm Jim Kenzie. Each new generation of a new vehicle should be better than the previous. It isn't always, but it is with the Santa Fe Sport. Hyundai has really hit the sweet spot in a very competitive segment. Yes, it's a good looking car, although I find they all kind of resemble each other in this segment. Terrific interior, seats might be a bit hard for yours truly, but what puts the Sport in this Santa Fe is the new two liter turbo. It has incredible get up and go on the highway and is a real treat to drive. The 2.4 is no slouch, but I would go with the turbo. Now with the demise of the Vera Cruz, Hyundai is coming out with a new seven-seater vehicle to be simply known as the Santa Fe. Before we go, make sure you check us out at MotoringTV.com and join us on Facebook. Get in on the conversation for the total motoring experience. That's it for now. We'll see you next time as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. In the past, that was more about you know the destination, the, the rugged off-road, you know, rock climbing. We're not too concerned. I mean, the segment's definitely evolved. We think we're going where the customers are, you know, migrating towards and um, evolving.